Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. Good morning, beloved family. How good to be with you. And actually, I'm with you in my heart and in my spirit, but I'm traveling at the moment. And so we have done a four-part series on gender theory. And so we're going to pick up today from where we left off tomorrow. And if we don't finish it today, uh, where we left off tomorrow, how's that? Um, where we left off yesterday. And if we don't finish today, we will continue tomorrow. So it's four parts. And um, I won't be able to take your calls, but I will take emails that that you've written in. And this is, again, from the magazine Calix Marie, Rebuilding Our Christian Civilization. Um, Maria Maddis is the the editor. It's uh, part of the Society for the Protection of the Unborn and um, and Voice of the Family. It's an outstanding magazine. I think it comes out four times a year. I'm not sure. I personally have subscribed to it, and I, I would um, in, encourage you to go, if I could, on the Internet <clears throat> and look, look up Calix Marie, uh, C-A-L-X, and then Marie, M-A-R-I-A-E, uh, The Heel of Mary. And um, and it's just everything about the family, and it's tremendous. And so the article that uh, is very appropriate and timely <clears throat> is Gender Theory, A Threat to the Family and the Proclamation of the Christian Faith, written by His Excellency Willem Jacobus Cardinal Eek. I don't know how to pronounce it, E-I-J-K. <clears throat> and he's talking about... Um, how very uh, um, damaging this is to God's design for us, for the family, for civilization. And we started a new section yesterday on the feminist, uh, the the, um, effect of uh, radical feminism on this movement. And we didn't complete it, so I'm going to go back to the beginning of just this section, which is titled Radicalization, radicalization of gender as the root of the gender theory. All right, let me just read this. I know we'll get through this today. Um, And it reads, gender theory has its roots in the radicalization of feminism in the 1960s and 70s. And and let me just interject here. I don't even think the word gender, sex, male or female, I don't think the word gender was even used uh, before then. <clears throat> and it says, which in fact began in the writings of Simone de Beauvoir, 1908 to 1986. She wrote a book called, she wrote In the Second Sex, published in 1945, 49 rather, the famous section, <clears throat> quote, now this is an astounding, but there are people saying this today, beloved. One is not born as a woman, but one becomes one. This is insanity. No biological, physiological, or economic destiny determines the figure which the female presents in society. It is civilization as a whole which generates this product. If you're a woman, you're a product. you got to get this straight, right? An intermediate between the male and the eunuch defined as female. This is feminism. This is... They're not even respecting themselves. This is insane. If you're a woman, you're an intermediate intermediate between a male and a eunuch. This is, how do you like that for a compliment from a woman? De Beauvoir argues that in pre-adolescence, there are not as many differences between a boy and a girl. When they come out of the womb, there are clear differences. This is crazy. They're both human beings. They have a lot of similarities, but clear differences. However, 
I mean, whoever was there present when a baby was born and, and it came out of its mother's womb and the mother stands there, the father stands there, the nurses, doctors say, hmm, I wonder what it's going to be, a boy or a girl or, a, or an it. it. It's just insanity. <clears throat> However, from the beginning of this stage, the boy is admitted to the world of men while the girl has to remain in the has to remain in the world of women and is therefore obliged to assume the social role of a woman evidently de, Bo- de Beauvoir is speaking of her own adolescence experience in the years after the first world war from the moment at which a girl matures physically society develops a certain hostility towards her <clears throat> Her mother criticizes her body, while the interest of males in her body causes her to feel like a physio- physical sexual ob- object. This woman uh, writing this must have had a horrible life and a horrible experience without any sense of her, her worth and of her beauty and of her dignity. This is just awful. This is making the human being worse than an animal. <clears throat> One cannot fail to recognize in her ideas that influ- um, one cannot fail to recognize in her ideas um, the influence of the theory of polymorphous perversity created by Sigmund Freud. According to this theory, the human person has no sexual orientation at the beginning. Hold on, beloved. I need to use a Kleenex or a hanky. Hold on. just amazing. According to this theory, the human person has no sexual orientation at the beginning. He or she is neither heterosexual nor homosexual, but becomes one or the other, depending on how um, psychological relationships with his or her parents develop. When in the home environment, the child directs sexual desires to the parent of the opposite sex, the child will become heterosexual. If these desires are directed to the parent of the same sex, the child will become homosexual. This is, um, there's no science in this. There's no medical knowledge in this. There's no sanity in this. This is as distorted as I think we can get. Under the influence of these ideas and other factors, radicalized feminism is convinced that the role of the married woman as an instrument for procreation and education of offspring is merely a social role imposed on her by society. God didn't create women uh, to have babies and uh, men and women to marry and populate the earth. It's just her social role. That's what the Blessed Virgin was doing, uh, just fulfilling her social role. This is so awful. It is also convinced that she can even must be liberated from this through contraception and artificial reproduction. In 1970, see, it's women who have destroyed themselves. In 1970, the radical feminist Firestone said that once liberated from the tyranny of their reproductive biology, let me just say, beloved, if you are liberated from anything God has made you to be, you will be most miserable your whole life. The only happiness, the, the only freedom is to be who God has made you and be that well, in the words of St. Francis de Sales. <clears throat> Firestone said once that liberated from the tyranny of their reproductive biology, women would be able to choose their role, irrespective of their biological sex. This liberation also requires an attack on the organized social unit surrounding reproduction and subjecting women to their biological destiny. That is the family, you see. Right from the beginning, beloved, right from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden on, Satan, the enemy of God in our souls, 
has wanted to destroy the family right from the beginning. And he's tried to destroy the people of Israel through whom the Messiah would come. He has tried through same-sex marriage, homosexualism, and, oh, every deviation to destroy the family. <clears throat> because if you destroy the family, then there's no church, and then there's no society. The family is the cell of society and God's number one instrument to build his kingdom. And therefore, I've said it many times, the enemy's number one target to destroy. And we're reading it from their own mouths. The object is to destroy the family. And we know that Our Lady of Fatima said to St. Said to Lucia, <clears throat> Sister Lucia, I, I can't canonize her, Sister Lucia, that the final battle will be for marriage and the family. And it's right here. It's right here. Firestone extended this demand to the destruction of all institutions which segregate the sexes from one another and children from the adult world, such as elementary schools. <clears throat> she adds a demand for the freedom of all women and all children to do as they wish sexually. This is a formula for murder, beloved, murder of the soul murder of the person. It's so awful. Um, we're going to continue reading when we come back from the break. Beloved, it's going to be a short break, and we will continue when we come back, and then halfway through, we'll take some of your emails. God bless you, and don't go away. We stand at a crossroads in history. We can stand up for life, family, and a Christian culture, or we can stand idly by while the fabric of society becomes fundamentally anti-life, anti-family, and anti-Christian, slowly leading to its own demise. LifeSite News is the leading defender of life, family, and Christian culture. Through our news reporting, we seek to educate readers with information and zeal. They need to fight the most crucial battles of our day. And we need your help to continue that mission. You can support LifeSite News by following our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Another way to support LifeSite is to prayerfully consider becoming a Sustain Life monthly donor to help us continue to save lives in the culture. To donate, visit give.lifesitenews.com forward slash sustain life. Our staff of over 40 and millions of future generations Thank you for helping to save the culture. This Divine Mercy Reflection is from the Diary of St. Maria Faustina. In paragraph 1729, St. Faustina speaks to Jesus. Despite the diligent care of my superiors and the efforts of the doctors, my health is fading and running out. Oh, how much I desire to be set free from the bonds of this body. Oh, my Jesus, you know that in all my desires, I always want to see your will. Of myself, I would not want to die one minute sooner, or live one minute longer, or to suffer less, or to suffer more. But I only want to do your holy will. Although I have great enthusiasm, and the desires burning in my heart are immense, they are never above your will. St. Faustina put God's will above even her health and life. She totally understood and embraced God's plan and her place in it. This Divine Mercy Reflection is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. We have another little short segment here before our next break, after which we'll take your emails and not calls today because this is pre-recorded, but absolutely fresh for you. It's a four-part series on gender theory, which is a, f a threat to the family and the proclamation of the Christian faith. And we have been reading the section subtitled Radicalization of Gender as the Root of the Gender um, 
theory, and it's it's based on a um, an awful feminism, an awful, distorted, sick view of mankind, and especially of women. And it says the ultimate revolution of feminism would in this way generate a new society in which, quote, humanity could return to its natural po- uh, polymorphous sexuality, that is, all forms of sexuality would be permitted and indulged. Now, how do, how do we ever prove that that's a return to what is natural? There's nothing in creation that says so. There's nothing in history. God created man and made man male and female. That's all you're going to get from, from the scriptures and the story of Adam and Eve that's about 6,000 years old. So where are you going to get otherwise? I have no idea, but it's never been other. God has condemned homosexuality throughout the Old New Testament and throughout the New. Hence, gender theory emerged. I'm reading the article now. Hence, gender theory emerged from radical feminism. It mu- Women, you want to be free. You want to be free from every restraint, and you are destroying yourselves. Yes, and your children and society, but you are only destroying yourselves, and you don't know what it is to be free, because only the truth can make you free, not your own redesign of God's creation. That'll never make you free. That'll make you a slave to your fallenness. It must be pointed out, the article reads, that this theory also has its beginnings in the introduction of large-scale hormonal contraception in the 1960s, which made possible the so-called liberation of women from their reproductive biology, thereby paving the way for the total detachment of gender from biological sex. Absolutely not. Contraception just allowed you to abort millions of more babies that you never even knew you had because the pill is an abortifacient. These developments once again emphasize the prophetic nature of Paul VI encyclical Humanae Vitae, which described the use of contraceptives to prevent procreation as an intrinsic evil that is essentially a wrongful act. There's nothing that's changed. It's an intrinsic evil a wrongful act, Paul VI clearly did not predict these developments in 1968, the year in which it was published. However, the significance of this encyclical later reached beyond the matter of procreation. For example, the French Freemason and gynecologist Pierre Simon attempted to enable the human person rather than the creator to give their own form to their nature and life. He saw in gynecology a way to accomplish this. An initial step for him was the widest possible promulgation of contraception means to bring about a radical change in the concept of the family. There's no change in the concept of the family. It is the destruction of the family. That's it. It is the destruction, wholesale destruction of the family, beloved. We continue. In 1990, Judith Butler concluded that the imposition of the conventional social roles on women and of heterosexuality is the sexual norm in society was part, as the sexual norm in society was part of a political plan. You see, God is a politician, right? Friedrich Nietzsche said, um, "There is no be- there is no being behind." Doing effective, there is no being behind doing, affecting, and becoming. Wrong. When a human being is born, that human being has done nothing, affected nothing, and became nothing but what God created him or her to be. Butler says there is no gender identity behind expressions of gender, but identity is constituted by its own expressions said to be the results of the latter. She says that gender imposed on a woman is constructed by power, partially in terms of heterosexual and phallic uh, phallic convictions. This is sick, beloved. This is intended to mean that in gender, 
taken as the social role, there are aspects which are socially determinant. That is, that women generally earn less than men for the same work. That until very recently, it was not legal for women to drive a car in Saudi Arabia. Or that even in the Netherlands until the 1950s, a married woman could not have her own bank account or was required to give it up when she got married. Nevertheless, there are aspects which are inseparably linked to biological sex. For example, the roles of man and woman in marriage, in the family, in procreation, and as father and mother. That's correct. No one determines that. Now, whatever roles that society determines are to be put on women and men and all of that, that's an entirely matter, but they have n- entirely different matter. They have nothing to do with your biological sex or gender. The next section is titled Gender Theory in the Light of the Christian Vision of Man. Let me give this a start. We probably won't be able to finish this today. We'll continue tomorrow. The fact that public opinion today readily accepts the total detachment of gender from biological sex is a consequence of a cocktail of hyper-individualism with its autonomous ethic mentioned above and a particular vision of man, especially dominant today in the English-speaking world. According to this viewpoint, the human person is limited, consciously or unconsciously, to the mind that is the rational consciousness and center of the autonomous will. In fact, to the highly complex biochemical and neuropsychological functions in the superior nuclei and cortex of the brain. This is therefore a materialist, a materialist vision of the human person. It's so distorted, beloved, but it may give you some answers, if shocking answers, to how we've gotten where we came today, and so fast. The body, on the other hand, is seen as something secondary. No, it's not, though. It's not secondary. We are a whole person, body and soul. The body, on the other hand, is seen as something secondary, not essential for the human person. Wrong. The body, God created the body first and breathed into Adam, and he became a living soul. The soul had to have a house. It had to have a body. And they became together one living being. The body, the article says, would be for the mind of man purely a means of self-expression. The mind, as the autonomous human person, determines the purpose and meaning of the body. Hence, it would also identify its gender without reference to biological sex. Everything I'm reading now is disaster. Everything I'm reading now is disaster. The the subject is gender theory in the light of the Christian vision of man. We haven't gotten to the Christian vision of man yet. This is the result of the fall and of man that has grown far, far, far from his maker and has little idea who he is or why he's on this earth. The article continues, as a result, two fundamental rules remain in sexual morality. One must not cause harm to or exercise power over a sexual partner. However, this vision of almost absolute autonomy is incompatible with the experience that the human person has a certain freedom within certain limits. The human person, while created in the image of God, hear that one, is not God himself and does not have absolute freedom. Now we're getting into the Christian view. Um... Furthermore, the human person is not only a mind, but a whole, W-H-O-L-E, made of a spiritual and a material dimension, soul and body. The human person is neither merely a soul nor merely a body, um, but both. Both man and woman have the same soul, otherwise they would have different Uh, essences, and hence they have equal dignity. The difference between the two sexes is therefore physical in nature. However, the body, including the reproductive and sexual organs, is not something which is secondary or accessory, 
but is part of the human being as a person. And like the human person, it is an end in itself. You hear that? It is an end in itself and not purely a means, the purpose of which can be determined by the human person. No. Nope. John Paul II writes in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor this, quote, a freedom which claims to be absolute ends up treating the human body as a raw datum, devoid of any meaning and moral values, until freedom has shaped it in accordance with its design. Ah. Goes on, nevertheless, the human body is not a raw datum because it is part of the human person. It has its own purpose and meaning, which the human person cannot change. Man and woman are not two different species. However, they have different roles complementing one another in the same human nature. This complementarity is indicative not of a difference in the decree of perfection or status, but of their reciprocal roles in procreation. Neither the man alone nor the woman alone is capable of procreation. They can only do so together. The wife makes the gift of paternity to her husband. The husband makes the gift of maternity to his wife. I heard Bishop Fulton Sheen once. I'll give us a little break here. I heard Bishop Fulton Sheen once on the matter of contraception. He said, those who who are against contraception, he said, suppose one day everyone decided to plug up their ears. They couldn't hear anything. And they'd, they'd be driving. They couldn't hear horns. They couldn't hear anything. They just were deaf. And suppose, he said... People decided to plug up their ears so they wouldn't hear anything. Too much noise in the world, they will not hear anything. And suppose they decided to cover their eyes and blindfold their eyes so they couldn't see. Soon the Catholic Church would come out with an encyclical. It is wrong to blindfold your eyes. It is wrong to plug up your ears. Doesn't it make sense why these organs were given you? And all of a sudden the articles come out, The Catholic Church is against eye control and against ear control. What, of course it is. Doesn't it make sense why these organs are given? And Bishop Sheen says, doesn't it make sense why our reproductive organs were given not to be plugged up, not to counter why God gave them to us? There's the music for our break, beloved, and we shall return right after the break. Um, You're not able to call in today, but we will take your emails. I worked in pro baseball for a long time, and we play on Sundays. And it was an easy excuse. I, I took the easy out and just didn't go to Mass. Got caught up on that whole selfishness, that whole, you know, um, I can do it all. The times when I was struggling were the times I needed God the most. And now that uh, I've come back and accepted God, my world has completely changed. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org today. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living. There's no better way to start your day than with spiritual formation from inspiring priests as they preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. That's Sermons for Everyday Living, weekdays 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. The future of the family is grim. As Our Lady of Fatima said, the final battle will be for the family. It truly seems as though we're in the heat of this final battle and we need your help. Our mission at LifeSite News is to educate and activate readers with the information they need to defend life and the family and restore Christian culture. We are currently the most popular pro-life website on the internet with over 40 million unique users every year. And we've been experiencing an even bigger reach than ever this year. But we need your help to reach more of the 7.7 billion people on Earth if we are to truly succeed in changing the culture. Please consider donating to help our mission of promoting the culture of life 
and fearless defenders of the faith like Mother Miriam. Visit give.lifesite.news.com to give today. Thank you for your support. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. I'm thrilled to be with you, and we do have this half hour together, but you won't be able to call in. This is a fresh program for you, uh, part three of our four-part on gender theory, but um, it's pre-recorded because I'm traveling. So I will take your text and emails, which we have in advance. Um, we have one text from someone who writes in anonymously and says, Mother, does your community have the 1962 Mass at your convent exclusively, and are you in Oklahoma? Yes, at the moment we're in Oklahoma, but again, excuse me, looking for a new home and diocese. Um, do we have the 1962 Mass at our convent exclusively? The answer is no. We we do att- excuse me now. Oh, hiccups. We do have uh, we do attend the Latin Mass, a Latin Mass parish and use the the 1962 Missal, although I personally love Father LeSance's Missal, and I think, oh, so sorry, I think it's 1945 or 48. The St. Andrew's Missal is also wonderful. Um, So, but uh, we don't have it at the convent. We really prefer to go to the parish. So, uh, yes, for that reason, most of us use the 1962. We do have Mass at our convent, uh, on a monthly basis so that we can keep the Blessed Sacrament here. Hold on one moment, beloved. Okay. I'm trying to stop my hiccups. We have a, an email from uh, someone who writes, Good morning, Mother, anonymously. I hope that you can kindly help me with some advice. I have a friend that I've known since high school, We are now both 50 years old, and we are both baptized Roman Catholics. I am a practicing Catholic and attend the traditional Latin Mass every Sunday at a local archdiocese parish, and my friend is a non-practicing Catholic. She has been promiscuous since high school, has dated several men and hung out in bars regularly. I cannot say for certain, but I'm fairly positive that she's been intimate with the men she has gone out with. They were and still are wild about her because of her promiscuous dress and lots of makeup. She has been civilly married and divorced and is now currently living with another man with whom she has a daughter. They are not married. He does not practice any religion at all, but they do attend a non-denominational church at Christmas and maybe Easter only. She did have her daughter baptized by some guy, she says, that she knows whom she told me was some kind, some kind of religious minister who told her that he does not believe in punishing the children because of the parents. <coughs> oh, that's a whole other topic, huh? She did not tell her boyfriend, the girl's father, because she did not think he would approve of the baptism. I doubt that her daughter's baptism was valid. My friend continues to live in sin with this man, uh, does not practice faith at all, I have tried to talk to her about her lifestyle. Um, I've tried to talk about her lifestyle with her in the past, and she did. She did admit that she knows the church does not like it very much. You know, that's a really a cop out because if anyone says to you, "I know the church doesn't like it," I'd say to her, "You need to have. The, you need to correct that to say, I know God doesn't like it,' because that'll take you directly to the source of the sin." The only thing the church forbids is what God forbids. Um, She said, how can I really tell her that she's endangering the salvation of her soul and that she needs to stop living in sin? She did mention that she had her boyfriend intend to get, she and her boyfriend intend to get married civilly, but it just keeps getting pushed off. I'm afraid to lose her as a friend if I confront her with this, but do not want to give in to human respect either. Thank you for your kind assistance and guidance in this situation, Mother. God bless you in your ministry. Well, I tell you what, uh, human respect um, 
is a question of we we refrain from helping people we claim to care about because we're worried about what they think of us. That's what human respect is. Um, you need to sit down with your friend, dear one, and you need personally uh, with her current partner not around, nobody around, just you and her, and you need to say, my friend, I know you don't have the faith I have. I know that. But you have a certain responsibility because you were baptized Catholic and you are living in very, very grave sin. And right now, you and your your partner are on the road to hell. Even if you got civilly married, you are on the road to hell because you are living in fornication Um you are, you've had a child out of wedlock. You are living a very sinful life. And unless you get right with God, God gives us the freedom to do what we want. He gives us the freedom to turn from him, just as Adam and Eve did, because he gave them the freedom. Uh, we have the freedom to follow him and be saved. We have the freedom to turn from him and be lost forever. Um, and she may say, well, God's not sending me to hell. He's too merciful and loving, and say, yes, he's merciful and loving, which is why he put his son on the cross instead of us. And he'll give us every opportunity to be in heaven. But if we turn from him, we refuse that, and we will have our way, which is to be in hell. God will never force us to be saved. So say, please listen to me. I, whether you believe it or not, I'm not holier than you. I'm not anything but I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. And I beg you to listen to me. If you refuse the bread, if you refuse, you're going you're gonna to go your way before God. Will I not be your friend anymore? No, I could be your friend. Um, but I'm not a friend if I condone what you're doing. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm only a friend because I care about you enough to tell you the truth, even if you get angry with me and... Uh, I uh, don't want our friendship anymore. That's how much I care about you. All right. You need to be direct with her. You must be direct. You must put the salvation of her soul before your friendship. Be direct in a very loving way, but don't mince words. We have an email from Elizabeth who writes, Dear Sister Miriam, I have an ongoing problem with my husband of 12 years. We got married later in life, both of us in our late 30s, and immediately had children. I got pregnant about a month after we were married. Our children are ages 8, 9, and 11. Oh, that's three children to have two years apart. I met my husband on a Catholic internet site. We live about eight hours away from each other. Um, Initially, the distance made me not want to get involved with him, but he appeared to have the same values as me. We both wanted a Catholic marriage with God at the center. I had worked and saved and even had my own home at the time and wanted to focus on motherhood if God were to bless us with a family. My husband agreed to all of this. My husband financially did not save at all. He also initially told me he had a stable job, but as we got closer to engagement, he wanted to change his job. We were both guided by a priest who believed, as I did, that my husband would work hard at getting a stable job to support the family. We got married by the priest. I paid for the wedding, uh, reception, and honeymoon. At the time, I was okay with this, as I believed my husband would do everything he could to provide for the family. He told me he was the prodigal son and was foolish in his youth and early adult adulthood, but changed. After we got married, moved out of state to an area where the cost of living was more reasonable than where I lived, my husband agreed to finish college. He had an associate's degree at the time. He had a job that did not pay well, but he said he was going to stay with it so he could finish college. This sounded reasonable to me. I tried to help my new husband by paying off his car debt and paying for his college so he could receive a bachelor's degree. However, he quit college after the first semester. He started to spend the saving I brought into the marriage by going out to dinner often, paying for others, and buying presents for his family. At the time, I was pregnant and started to get concerned 
that by the time I had the baby, he was still not able to support the family. He appeared to have no concept of finances. For instance, he started to volunteer teaching catechism when he did not have a career to support us. He would tell me he wanted to give gifts to his godchildren in the amount of $500 and also wanted to buy a new car for his parents. At this point, I was irate. I knew I had to be very blunt with him and tell him no. I was not going to let him buy a car for his parents. This advanced into a fight, and my husband eventually gave away his parents, gave his parents his car. His Catholic parents took it and told me to honor my husband. Oh, this is an awful situation. They eventually gave back the car to my husband, but it took three years. These events all happened within the first three years of our marriage. From this point, I moved back with my mom, pregnant with, a ba- with baby number two, and my husband moved in with us. I was ready to go back to work in the area where I had connections to pay for me and my family. I was torn be- between being a mom and working, natural family planning, and getting pregnant again by a financially irresponsible man, my vows, and divorce. I had another child soon after the second child. All the promises this man had made to me seemed to be easily broken. He actually went bankrupt um, when I paid for every major expense. Yet I kept fighting for the major. I'm not sure what that means, major. Some Catholic counseling, but in f- maybe major expenses. I don't, some Catholic counseling, but infrequent and never resolving anything. We eventually moved to where my husband grew up. We bought a house that he told me he would financially help me pay the bills for. I was hesitant about buying this home because it was an old estate that needed a lot of repairs, but he insisted that he could fix the house and work. I tried to allow him to be the leader. I told myself this would be the last straw if he did not contribute to paying bills. Four months after, into buying the home, he claimed he had to work on the house to rebuild it since he gutted it and needed a lot of repairs. He gutted rooms without my consent, and now he is home 24-7, fixing the home for the last year and a half. I'm concerned for my children. I try to initiate prayer in the family and have my family say the rosary that he will participate in at times. He also goes to church with us that he does not want to get any help for our marriage, saying he is too busy fixing the house. I am aware of Julie and Greg Alexandria and the program they have for Catholic marriage. I pleaded with my husband to be part of their program, but the answer is always after something, and it never comes to fruition. I have Now, this is a long email. We're almost done, beloved, but I, I know this is not an um, isolated situation, so I'm reading through it for others as well. I have little respect for my husband. The only time he talks to me is when he needs money for the house. He can never pay for a dinner or take me or the children out or pay a bill because he has no savings and no job. He wants to be respected, but treats me horrible, constantly complaining about how I am not up to par on my domestic duties. Oh, help. He currently has been threatening to divorce me after he completes fixing the home so he can get half of what the house is worth. This is not a Catholic or Christian marriage. My children do not see love in this marriage, and I believe I may be deserving of an annulment. I am the sole breadwinner of the family. Do not trust my husband financially or in general. My husband, Christian slash, my husband, Christian slash Catholic parents, turn this around on me and never tell me my husband to get his act together. All I really wanted was a true Catholic marriage for my children and for God. I know that this is how my children will learn love, and I am responsible for teaching them that. I am thankful for my health and that God has blessed me to endure this situation thus far. Please give me advice. This marriage is headed for a divorce, which I've tried to avoid. I'm at the end of ideas on what to do to rectify the situation. Thank you for your time and guidance. Sincerely, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, dear one, we're going to have to go to this break, and then as soon as we come back from the break, I'll give you my thoughts on this. It's truly an awful situation. Hang on. 
Don't go away. We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you'll join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Station of the Cross. Confusion on matters of faith and morals is widespread, even within the church. It can be disheartening, with clergy celebrating gay pride masses, the Pope considering allowing women to become priestesses. It is easy to lose sight of the true teachings of the church. LifeSite News Catholic can help. We are a clear, trustworthy news source that is dedicated to the teachings of the church. We, as the laity, have a duty to know and defend our faith and tradition. In order to do so, we must be educated on the teachings of the church and on the truth about current events and developments within the church. Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up to receive our emails by going to LifeSiteNews.com in order to maintain your clarity and peace in the midst of chaos. Have you ever felt insignificant or unworthy of God's love? In the Gospel of Matthew, our Lord reminds us that even all of the hairs of our head have been counted. Each and every one of us, at every stage of life, is valuable to the kingdom. Human life is sacred. Think about it. CoalitionForLife.com Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Hi, beloved. Welcome back to Mother Miriam Live. It's our last segment, and we've just read um, a lengthy email from someone who writes in anonymously. Uh, she got married, uh, was very independent, had her own home and job, uh, responsible, and she got married to a man who um, is utterly irresponsible and has not matured and um, has never gotten a stable job, which he promised to get, um, and is defying everything that has to do with being a husband and um, uh married and all of that responsibilities and they now have three young children um and she wants to know what she she said you know she does she have material for for an annulment i would say you probably do because he was very immature when you married him i don't think you should have ever married this man and um i wish your priest had also uh, been more prudent in in marrying the two of you. I think he should have had uh, your husband-to-be six months or a year to get on his feet to show that he could have a stable job and be mature about handling money before you entered into this marriage. Unfortunately, it happened. I, maybe your desire to be married was so strong that uh, you weren't able to rightly discern all these things. So it's a marriage that I think should not have taken place, but it has. Um you say the marriage is headed for a divorce. What I would do in this situation, it's it's so bad. Now, normally I would suggest a wife stay with her husband in all of this and really live her faith and see if God will convert him through that. In the situation with your husband uh, who simply wants to, now he's spending 24-7 at home, he won't get a job because he's redoing the house, and he wants to complete this um, fix her upper house so that when he's done with it, he can get a divorce and get half the price of the house. This is insane. Um, I would um, 
I don't know. I don't know that he can get any price for the house at all. I mean, it's bit, it's all your money. His name shouldn't even be on if you had a loan or whatever it is. Uh, he should have nothing to do with it. But if you've put his name on, if he is indeed half owner on what I don't know, he's a half owner. If you're the sole owner, you have no problem. Um, I would ask him to move out and have and be separated from your family until he is able to grow up and be responsible and get a job and support his family and desire to be a husband and a father and get spiritual direction from a priest. I would ask him to move out. Don't talk about divorce or annulment. If he won't, if he said, tough on you, do what you want, I'm not moving out, I would move. I would go with the children and move. Um, You take your finances, he should have no access to the bank account, no access to a single penny whatsoever. You need to take it. You need to change banks. You need to do whatever you can. Credit cards, uh, destroy them. Do everything in your name. Move out. Rent a plow house. Do whatever you have to do. Take the children and raise them. And try not to even let him know your address. Um, he can have a way to communicate with you through email, perhaps. But um, he needs to know that this is serious. And he can't be a little boy anymore doing his own thing. And so I would strongly, I wouldn't threaten him with it. I would just do it. I would just, you've, you've talked to him enough. He's violated everything enough. And he's let you know his plans. He's going to finish the house so he could have a divorce and sell it and get half its value. Uh, I, would, I would end it right now and simply take the children and move out, protect yourselves, and he no longer has a single penny to live on. Let him grow up. And you don't need to talk about a divorce. You don't need to talk about annulment. Just do this and um, let him face the reality of it. And either he's going to be converted, either he's going to grow up and come begging for forgiveness and all of that. And if he does beg for forgiveness, do not take him back. Say, okay, I, there's no question I forgive you. God forgives us. There's no question but I need to see you grow up into a mature, responsible man. You have to get a place to live. You have to get a stable job and do all of this. And if he says, can't you help me till I do that? You cannot. You've done it long enough. No more. You've done it for 12 years. No more. So that's my advice to you. I I don't know uh, if we were in a phone conversation, you might have other things to come back with, you know, that are, are complications. But I would simply do that. Just do it and let, leave him on his own. And if the house is in your name, you need to uh, quickly sell it and, and he, has, he doesn't get half at all because you're not talking about a divorce. You're, it's in your name and you're selling it and you're moving. So I don't know if what's possible there. But don't let money be the issue that stops you from this. You need to have this man out of your lives right now, and he has to grow up. Okay. And if there's a court case, and if he's allowed to see the children, to visit them, that's fine. But don't let him take them overnight. And um, this has to be a very, very clear arrangement. That's what I would say. Because he'll poison your children against you. So... um, I think you just need to take them and go where he's not going to know you are um, at the moment. All right. Uh, We have a text from Jerry who says, my Protestant friends say that Catholics don't know their scriptures. I feel like I know the Bible pretty well, even though I cannot quote chapter and verse like he can. Was there a time in the Catholic Church when it was prohibited or at least discouraged for laity read the Bible? Absolutely there was, because in the 1500s, Martin Luther, who left, who was an Augustinian monk, Catholic, he decided that he knew better than the church, he knew better than the Pope, uh, than everybody else, and he left the church, and he um, did away with the papacy, did away with the sacraments, did away with the Eucharist, transubstantiation, called it consubstantiation, which is is very, totally different, and he said, we are Christians, We have the indwelling Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible, and he should know what he meant, what he said, and he lives within us. So we're each our own interpreters. And within Luther's time, all the hundreds or thousands who 
who believed him and who went with him, and that's how the Lutheran church got its start, he was reinterpreting all kinds of things. And people said to him, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't say that. You can't. And actually, they started interpreting the scripture against what Luther said. And Luther said to them, you can't come up with your own interpretation. And they said, but that's what you taught us. We have the, Holy, the resident Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, to know what he meant by what he said. So we're our own teachers. That's what you taught us, Martin. And so very, very difficult. And before the f- invention of the pre- printing press, which was also the 1600s, um, it, it took a year's salary to even reproduce a Bible because there was no printing press. So people had to learn from all the art, stained glass windows, the preaching of the, of the priests who did have the scriptures. And so for anyone to just take a scripture and come up with their own interpretation was very, very dangerous. So the laity were forbidden to do that. And they said, no, you go to church and have the scriptures taught to you. So that's no longer the case today, but it was for a time, yes. And it, it was Martin Luther that said, if it weren't for the Catholic Church, we would not have the scriptures because the scriptures were written by the Catholic Church and given uh, the infallible, inerrant scriptures. And Martin Luther, 1,500 years later, single-handedly threw out seven books that are in the Septuagint that our Lord had on earth, seven uh, books and parts of other books, um, single-handedly by himself, and if people didn't stop him, he would have thrown out even more books. So, um, yeah, that was, that was problematic. But I would say, dear Jerry, we as Catholics must know the scriptures. Uh, we don't. Not, we don't hold a candlestick to evangelical Protestants. That's all they have, so they're in it all the time. But we need to get to know the Scriptures more, absolutely. God bless you, beloved, and we'll see you tomorrow. We'll speak with you tomorrow.